Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera. Your look at the world of business and economics. This week, not enough food for everyone. The UN says hunger is still on the rise in many parts of the world, but some progress has been achieved. Also this week, AI is expected to revolutionize businesses, but it's very expensive. So are the benefits worth the upfront costs? Plus, keeping the lights on in Iraq, we take a look at how the oil-rich nation is trying to solve its electricity crisis. Nearly 30% of the world's population was moderately or severely food insecure last year. Well, that means 2.6 billion people did not have access to nutritious, safe and sufficient food all year round. Millions of those went hungry. That's according to a new report by the United Nations and WHO. Well, the UN has previously warned of an unprecedented global food crisis in 2022 and cautioned this year could be even worse. But some progress has been reported. The report says levels of hunger worldwide did not worsen between 2021 and 2022. However, it is still on the rise, particularly in Western Asia, the Caribbean and all sub-regions of Africa. Up to 783 million people went hungry in 2022. That's still higher than before the COVID-19 pandemic. The UN remains nowhere near meeting its zero hunger target by 2030. The conflict remains the biggest driver of food shortages. Climate change, trade disruptions and soaring food costs have played a major role too. Prices reached an all-time peak in March 2022 after Russia invaded Ukraine, but they've since eased. Now we take a look at how people in Lebanon and Democratic Republic of Congo are coping with hunger. Lina Barclay reports. The Nimer family shows us a glimpse of what life is now like for many Lebanese. The basics, including food, are no longer affordable. A nearly bankrupt state can't provide services and the poor can't afford to buy water. There are times when we go to sleep hungry. Our situation is very bad. We sometimes have lunch but no dinner, or we eat lunch but not breakfast. We eat once a day. Bilal al Nimer's salary is not enough to feed his six children. Most days he just brings home bread. It's estimated that it costs $30 a month for a person to eat in Lebanon. Bilal earns $40 a month. Everything in the market is expensive and the dollar keeps gaining value against the lira. Today, I bought them two bags of bread. If they want to drink tea with the bread, we don't have sugar. It's very expensive. The World Bank says Lebanon ranks first in food price inflation. Nearly one and a half million Lebanese are struggling to put food on the table. That's more than 40 percent of the population. While inflation causes families to go hungry in Lebanon, conflict is doing the same thing in Democratic Republic of Congo. Furaha used to be a farmer. She fled her home in Kichanga, along with her nine children, as fighting intensified between government forces and the M23 rebel group. Living in this camp hasn't been easy. Her family are provided with food, but it isn't enough. Our life is very different here since we left our village, where I used to farm my own food to feed my family. But here in the camp, we only receive 20 kilos of maize, which needs to last us almost two weeks. It's not easy to survive with that. Her story is just one among the six million people who've been forced from their homes. The local government is doing what it can to keep these displaced people fed but it'll take outside help to keep them from going hungry. Lina Abakle for Counting the Cost. Joining us from Rome now is David Laborde. He's director of Agri-Food Economics Division at the Food and Agriculture Organization. Good to have you with us. So David, in your latest report, you've mentioned despite the challenges, there is some progress. Is a trend forming here or was this just a one-off in terms of the progress? Right now, we just have a stop in the rising of hunger. So the problem is that since 2019, we were on a rising trend. So the good news is that this trend has stopped. So we have stabilized, but we have stabilized at a 
high level. So if you allow me this comparison, I will say that we have stopped drowning, but we are still lost in the middle of the sea uh, with actually seven and 735 million people in chronic hunger. All right, let's start with the good news then. What stopped the rise, at least in hunger? What stopped us from drowning, to use your analogy? It's mainly the fact that we are recovering from the COVID-19 crisis. So economies are growing again in most parts of the world. So it means that households are recovering job and income. Unfortunately, at the same time, we have the rising cost of living and that has compensated. But really the fact that economy is back in business is what is driving this change. Could we see the hunger levels then actually start to decline going forward? Yes, I mean that what we should have already seen actually this year, uh, I mean, in 2022, unfortunately, didn't materialize due to a number of shocks, including rising food uh, prices, energy prices. So when we are going to remove some of this shock, things should recover. But even with potentially the good news of no more war in Ukraine, uh, potentially better weather, we are not on track to achieve the SDG2, so the development goals. And in our projection, we see that by 2030, without even factoring new prices, we will still have 600 million in chronic, people in chronic hunger. So normally the situation is going to improve, but not enough to achieve the goal we have, that is to eliminate hunger and malnutrition. All right. So what needs to be done then? Because you're saying that even if we see an end to some of those factors which have pushed prices have pushed uh, hunger levels up. Even if that, that ends, we're still not on track. What needs to be done to get us on track? We need two main things. On one hand, we need to make our agri-food system more resilient because unfortunately, shocks are going to continue to happen, in particular, climate shock. Um, you know, we have been uh, in three years on a row of La Nina and this year we have El Nino. So we really need to make the system more resilient by investing in it, in technology, in infrastructure, um, in knowledge. And at the same time, we need to make the economic growth and the system more inclusive in mm. order to not have no one left behind. Because that's what we see, uh, and I would say even last year, what we have seen is actually hunger reduced in Asia and in Latin America, but increasing in the Middle East and in Africa. And what we want is to actually see economic growth delivering Reduction of hunger everywhere for everyone, but it means be inclusive with better social policies and a number of public intervention actually to, to deliver on this. So resilience and inclusiveness. What about the level of debt? Is that an issue when it comes to trying to reduce the number of people going hungry? You are totally right, because actually I will say for 2023, we have two threats on global food security. One is El Nino and the other is a debt crisis. We have now more than 70 low and middle income countries that face high level of debt. And as I've said, in order to make a system more inclusive and more resilient, you are going to invest. You are going to need to have public policies. And if you are in a low and middle income economy that cannot borrow or has already spent too much actually in paying interest on the debt, you cannot do this long-term investment. So instead of making the system more resilient over time, we are going just to try to um, extinguish fires, uh, but with less capacity. And that's what we want to avoid. Let's talk a little bit about wheat supplies. We know that a grain deal, a deal to get Ukraine's uh, grain out, is kind of hanging in the balance. What happens if things don't go smoothly with that? Are we going to see a, another sort of grain and wheat crisis? Uh, having the, the, the Black Sea Grain Initiative last year was, was very important. It has helped uh, Ukrainian farmers to export, consumers in the world to, to get uh, grains. And if we don't see this deal renewed, uh, it's going to reduce uh, the global supply. So we are going to see some tension on, on prices. Of course, Ukraine is not the only producer, so we, we should not um, just, I would say, panic about it, you know. Uh, there is grain around, so uh, we don't expect prices to skyrocket like last year, but still it's going to reduce the supply in a system that is still uh, weakened and uh, exposed to prices. We still don't know how bad El Nino is going to be actually on crops. And I will say last but not least, 
Uh, in the medium run, we need Ukraine to recover. Uh, Ukraine is a large country with a huge agricultural potential and will contribute to uh, continue to feed the world in the future. And the longer the, the, the war lasts, the less the Ukraine can export its grain. So meaning that the less farmers can make money in Ukraine, they cannot invest. And unfortunately, uh, even if the war st were stopping today, uh, we think that it will always take more than five years for Ukrainian farmers to recover. So yes, let's keep the markets open, let grain flow, and um, farmers farming. All right. And as you look at, shall we call it, the world hunger map, what areas, what parts of the world worry you the most? In the last year, uh, we have seen a deterioration of the situation in North Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East. So we already have this hotspot uh, where, unfortunately, we have a combination of conflict, slow economic recovery in some cases, the impact of uh, world prices and climate shock. So that's going to continue. We, we know that the Horn of Africa is still very weak. The situation in Yemen remains problematic. But now we also have a conflict in Sudan. So all these parts are exposed. But during El Nino years, for example, Central America, um, where we have a number of vulnerable countries and households, can also be exposed to this shock. So a lot of countries that are actually in the tropical zone can be exposed to that. Uh, but the main continent uh, today uh, that we really have to, to support uh, remain Africa. All right. Thanks so much. David, the board there. Thank you for having me. It's seen as a game changer that can transform businesses in various sectors. Artificial intelligence can reduce costs by up to 30 percent, increase efficiency and improve products for many firms. That's according to a recent report by McKinsey. Well, companies are increasingly exploring ways to integrate it in their operations. But implementing AI is very expensive. Many researchers warn of its impact on jobs and humanity. Fintan Monaghan reports. At a UN conference on artificial intelligence, journalists were invited to an unusual press conference. AI taking questions from the media. One reporter asked if jobs will be displaced. I will be working alongside humans to provide assistance and support and will not be replacing any existing jobs. Are you sure about that, Grace? Yes, I am sure. But many aren't so sure. While experts say there are limits to what AI can do, they're getting better all the time. Investment bank Goldman Sachs predicts more than 300 million jobs are going to be disrupted by the AI revolution. Historically, technology has always led to some jobs being displaced. The hope is it will also create new jobs. As many as 60% of workers today are in occupations that didn't exist in 1940. But the AI revolution is expected to impact white-collar professions hardest. In the US, screenwriters have been on strike. One of their major concerns is that studios will use AI to replace them, or use the threat of AI writers to force down pay. Obviously, AI can't do what writers and humans can do, but I don't know that they believe that necessarily. So we need to make it clear there needs to be a human writer in charge, and we're not trying to be gig workers just revising what AI does. Governments across the world are also concerned. The U.S. has devised a strategic plan on AI, underlining the importance of preparing the workforce for the changes to come. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Congressman questioned the CEO of the company that created ChatGPT, one of the most prominent AIs. He said ultimately, AI will create more employment than it displaces, a view echoed by the World Economic Forum. I believe that there will be far greater jobs on the other side of this and that the jobs of today will get better. For industries, there may also be pain in the short term, as companies pay the cost of adaptation. Analysts say Google would incur an extra $6 billion in costs by 2024 if it responded to half its search queries with 50-word answers from an AI chatbot. But the opportunities are undeniable. AI's impact on productivity is expected to add trillions to the global economy. The question is who reaps the rewards and who suffers the consequences. Vincent Monaghan for Counting the Cost. Well, joining us from London is Carl Benedict Frey. He's the Director of Future of Work at the Oxford Martin School at Oxford University. Good to have you with us. So let's start with costs then. How expensive is AI for businesses? 
Well, it depends very much on which type of application we're talking uh, about. So in the new world of generative AI with ChatGPT, we saw when Facebook's Llama model was inadvertently released to the public, you know, a few software engineers were managed to tweak it and improve it uh, just with, you know, uh, a few uh, hundred dollars uh, in terms of financial resources. So in certain applications, it can be very cheap. In other applications, obviously, it depends on which sort of data you have access to yourself for fine tuning, but the software itself is not uh, very expensive. So is it for all businesses then? Well, it depends very much on which type of work you're engaged in, but it's true it's a general purpose technology. My like electricity, which has transformed the economy as we know it. So generative AI is uh, very much what's being discussed this day, but artificial intelligence is going to transform transportation, it's going to transform logistics, it's going to transform construct construction, a lot of old industries um, as we know them as well. And it obviously expands the type of work that can be automated in manufacturing in warehouses as well. Order picking used to be a key bottleneck, which meant that Amazon had to employ hundreds and thousands of workers. Um, artificial intelligence is gradually overcoming those sort of bottlenecks. Now, the idea of adopting AI is what? To make the system more efficient and create bigger profits, right? Well, you can create new profits in two ways, right? You can automate things and replace labor and make workers become more productive in existing activities. Or you can use AI for innovation to develop new products, new industries that create new jobs and increases their demand for labor, right? So you can generate new profits in very different ways. And unfortunately, what we've seen over the past couple of decades is that AI and other technologies have primarily been used for automation. That has led to a lower share of labor share of income as more work has been automated. It's led to lower wages and, and pressure on in particular low and uh, middle uh, income jobs. But we can use AI to create new products and industries um, as well, uh, which would have very much the opposite effect and I think would be you know, more profitable in the long run, right? Where, where do think the profits it. go, Carl, though? It's expected to add more than $4 trillion to the economy. Who's going to be getting the bigger slice of that pie? You know, if you use AI for automation, most of the gains are going to uh, turn out in terms of capital gains, uh, in terms of profits, and owners of capital will, will, will gain disproportionately there. Um, but if you use AI to develop new products and new industries that demand new labor, well, then those gains will be much more equally shared. And remember, if all we've done over the past 200 years was automating things that we already did in 1800, we would not be much richer as a consequence of that, right? The much, reason we're much richer as a society is that we develop new goods, products and services that were previously inconceivable. What happens, though, to workers who are not upskilling, especially in, in countries that are struggling with other basic problems? So fortunately, AI has the potential to act as an interactive tutor. And in addition to that, there's some... Uh, evidence to suggest that it's actually easing barriers to entry, right? It's a bit like what Uber had done to taxi services, right? With GPS technology and the Uber app, all of a sudden knowing the name of every street uh, in London or New York was no longer a particularly valuable skill. So anybody with a taxi could all, uh, all of a sudden jump into the car and become a taxi driver. AI is doing sort of similar things to content creation. If you're uh, not a very good or talented writer, well, with ChatGPT, you can become an average writer. If you're not a great software engineer and coder, well, with GitHub's Copilot, you can become, become an average coder. So that means that more people will be able to perform those professions. It also means more competition in those, though, and potentially lower wages for the people in those kind of jobs. But it reduces the barriers to entry, and it means that, you know, AI is potentially helping people into new jobs and into new um, tasks as well. All right, what about the question of mistakes? Might mistakes generated by an AI system be more costly, more damaging, more difficult to fix? It can indeed. And I think it's, you know, your question very much goes to the question of resilience, right? So during a shock like the Great Recession and the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it's an open question of how well do firms then 
perform in times of great uncertainty. Because we know, for example, that AI systems don't perform very well in domains where there are a lot of rare events, right? So take autonomous cars, for example. We don't have them on the street yet. The reason for that is that there are so many different situations that the car or a driver can encounter in the, uh, city traffic, it's almost impossible to predict them with you know, even very large data sets, right? And if you have a lot of you know, tail events, then AI will struggle with that because it tends to drive more towards the average. So there's a real risk that businesses that rely more on artificial intelligence will turn out to be re less resilient under rare uh, circumstances. In addition, I think you mentioned the point of misinformation or outright hallucination. Uh, you know, we know that ChatGPT fabricates things. Unfortunately, there are no quick fixes there. And what it means that, you know, for the foreseeable future, we will have to keep a human in the loop and do fact checking as a consequence. So there's still a role for us humans in the future then. Good to know. Thanks so much, Carl Benedict Frey there. My pleasure. Power cuts in Iraq are making life increasingly uncomfortable as summer temperatures soar. Neglected infrastructure, wars, Western sanctions and corruption have all caused outages for decades. Well, the nation has taken several steps to tackle the problem. Iraq has signed a $27 billion deal with France's Total Energies to help solve its power shortages and increase oil production. The project would recover natural gas from three oil fields and use it to generate electricity. It also includes the construction of a seawater treatment plant and a solar power plant. The nation has also linked its power grid to neighboring countries to help solve the power shortages. The interconnection with Jordan and Egypt has started supplying Iraq with electricity earlier this month. Mahmoud Abdul Wahid reports from Baghdad. Summer time in Iraq and scorching temperatures are coupled with frequent power cuts. The eastern suburbs of Baghdad are among the hardest hit. The state grid only supplies electricity for three hours out of every six. 70-year-old Kadhmiya lives with her family in their small house. Most of their household equipment doesn't work anymore. We don't use the fridge anymore because it was ruined by electricity cuts and our food perished. These days, we splash water on ourselves to alleviate the heat. War damage and decades of neglected infrastructure have long caused shortages. Blackouts have increased because some facilities have been attacked by armed groups. Some Iraqis have bought generators to hire them out to neighbors. With a fragile national grid, local generators like these have become a profitable business venture. You can see their wires dangling in streets and crisscrossing alleys all over the country, posing a safety threat to residents. Abu Fatima operates a privately owned generator. Recently, we haven't been receiving subsidized fuel to operate generators. Thus, prices have reached $10 per ampere, adding more burden on consumers. Iraq relies on gas from Iran to fuel power stations, which supply the national grid. They normally produce around 20,000 megawatts of electricity, but need 24,000 megawatts during the peak summer months. To fill the gap, Iraq is getting interconnected with other countries. The grid connection with Jordan starts with 150 megawatts and will reach 950 megawatts. This is a double circuit connection to also link Iraq with Egypt via Jordan in the future. It's meant to boost our grid in the western region and later link Iraq with grids in the Gulf countries and Turkey. Iraq also needs to pay its bills for Iranian gas. Iraqi power stations need around 35 million cubic meters of Iranian gas every day, but are 20 million short because the Iranians have suspended deliveries pending payment, which is the last thing Iraqi electricity consumers want to hear, as they search in the baking summer heat for alternative energy sources. Qatar's energy minister says his nation is set to sign record volumes of long-term liquefied natural gas contracts this year. Saad al kabi expects Doha to provide nearly 40% of new global LNG output by 2029. 
European countries increasingly turned to Qatar in the U.S., mainly for LNG supplies after Russia invaded Ukraine. The Gulf nation has signed its second major gas supply deal with a Chinese state-controlled company in June. And that's our show for this week. Remember, you can get in touch with us via Twitter. Use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. There's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Sami Zaydan. From the whole team here, thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.